So you need it summed up short and sweet? Well, here you go. What happens when you take balancing to an extreme? When every character is powerful? No one is. D&D 4th Edition was an attempt at revamping the complicated and oftentimes messy 3.5, an edition loved by many, me included, but how did it revamp the very well-liked 3.5? The answer is not well. It sought to balance the game by taking all of the complicated races, classes, and subclasses, the prestige rules, variant features, and complicated, diverse monsters, and it just straightened them out at one level. And that was the highest level of complication possible. I mean, every character from wolves to bandits had a set of powers, and these powers grew in complexity and strength based on level, and they were split into three categories, and they all had this. Those were the at will, which meant that they could be used an unlimited number of times per day. The per encounter, which meant they could be used a certain number of times per initiative, usually once, but sometimes two or more and the daily powers, which meant that they could be used once per day. Every power had its dice set the same, supposing you were the same level. So a level one character had a d6 per encounter attack. So did a bandit. As a consequence of this, every player felt the same, but so did every non-player. And they were all stacked with these abilities. The classes were rigid, the choices were meaningless except for the damage types, and it was way too complicated because of all that stuff I just said to figure out what you actually rolled when it came time to roll in the game about rolling dice because the stupid modifier keeps changing. Like, okay, let's back up. There were these things called rolls in 4th edition. They were a sort of header category system for classes. They were the controller, defender, leader, and striker. Each of them had classes that would be familiar to you, like Wizards were controllers, and fighters were defenders, but they didn't matter. Every class had one feature that another class also had, so you could play a fighter ranged with basically magic, or a wizard close range with melee with abilities that didn't necessitate having magic. It didn't matter the flavor text, the rolls and damage were the same. There were no unique abilities, no features that let you do something that truly mattered. And it was even worse for classes within the same role. For example, all leaders had the same healing power with the name swapped out, and all strikers had the same attack powers with the names changed. They were all the same in every way. But wow, look at how many classes we have. Don't you feel like your choices matter? As a consequence, everything began to feel very samey, and it also started to get boring, but not because of a lack of things happening, but instead it was the sheer number of things happening that would make you go numb and you would just fall into a vegetative state. Every character, regardless of importance, was as complicated as a player character, and every player character had an insane amount of choice that largely didn't matter. But they still had those abilities, even if they were all the same. And to play the game, you had to use them. Because you couldn't just attack or cast a spell, you had to use a power. These abilities and powers could be tied to an attack. They would grant another ally a bonus to their hit, or they could trigger when you're attacked and grant you a bonus to your AC, or a penalty to the enemy's attack. Players and enemies had these abilities, and so we're back to the modifier thing that I mentioned before. Your powers, as they're officially called, were linked to certain things that you had, or gave you certain things that you could do. Some powers, for example, only worked with melee weapons, so if you had a melee weapon, you would take those powers. If you didn't, you would take the other ones. The powers would define the character, and no amount of character could define a power set. You would just take the things. The same worked with ability scores. If you were a warlock, you would use... I think it was charisma. It could have been constitution. If you were a fighter, you would take strength. That one I remember. Back to the powers, though. The powers and the attacks and everything required that their bonuses be recalculated every turn when they're used. 
not because they say so, but because in one round, the field would change so much because everyone had powers that you just had to do the math again at every single step. Like, okay, if you grew up spoiled, joining D&D during the reign of 5e, then you'll have no clue how lucky you have it. Just as an example for the prone condition, the condition that's been around since the first edition of the game. Nowadays, with a melee attack, you get advantage to hit a prone character. But back then, there was no advantage. It was all plus ones and twos. So for example, with the prone, you got a plus two to hit them. And they got a minus two to hit you. Unless ranged, it's kind of like 5e, but worse. Because not only could they be prone, they would also have way more conditions stacked on them. And it was very regular that every single character on the battlefield would have three or four or five active conditions at a time. Plus, all those little million abilities and powers that you have, those ones that you can use at will or per encounter, those inflict conditions that change dice rolls with little plus ones and twos, and often they only do so for one round at a time. So one character, because just, they're just a soup of modifiers, and they're each and every roll ebbing and flowing in either direction, making tracking anything a complete nightmare, because they just kept changing. Every combat was like, one step forwards, two steps back. But with each turn, someone saying, wait, 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 you forgot about this, or hold on, I actually hit last round because of this. It, the fights would take forever, and this flood of abilities would actively discourage role-playing in combat. It made it into a war game, because if you did start to flavor something, otherwise known as have fun, you would be taking away from the game because you only had so much time to a session, and combat was an intense process that you had to get through without each character getting their just desserts for that cool thing that they can do because, hold on, we're not taking this combat to next game. It better finish. It turned intense battles into a slog, and that's only the half of it. We haven't even gotten to the role-playing aspect of this role-playing game yet. To sum it up shortly, 4th edition broke role-playing. While in combat, everything was strict and on an insanely leveled playing field. There was hardly any room for creative characters or inventive play. It was just, you, you had a list of things you could do, and you would just pick the best of those things to hit the guys that were red or whatever, you know? What you needed to roll to do them, you'd figure it out later. The DM would stick a pencil in their ear just to try to drown out the numbers being screamed at them. However, this assumed that everyone wanted to play, in terms of complexity, a wizard, and gave no, no choices for empty-headed barbarians. On the opposite hand, role-playing, dialogue, conversation, travel on the road. It should have been the opposite of that. It should have let anyone play any kind of character they wanted, the complex characters could stay complex, the simple-minded characters could, for once, take a break. It was meant to be this free-for-all aspect of the game, but it wasn't. It wasn't at all. Role-playing outside of combat in 4th edition was generally an exercise in freeform narration, but only on the DM's part. It was weighted much less mechanically to actions and combat type things. There were very few specified things for haggling or moving treasure out of a dungeon or building anything. As the rules are written, there's not, you know, no rules, which means that it's all on the DM, right? Right? Wrong. Each interaction is scripted. If not given something to roll on the sheet, it cannot be done. The DM is actively discouraged from letting it happen, and if it is given a roll, the player must ask to roll that very specific roll. The DM cannot 
tell them what to roll. They can say, you want to do this? Okay, what are you rolling to do it? Not, here's what to roll to try to do that. It's not like 5e. There is active... It's terrible! If a character wants to investigate, they must ask to roll investigation to get the information for that investigative thing. If they want to look around a corner, but they choose to roll investigation, oh no, the DM's paper says perception. I guess you can't do that and you learn nothing. You learn that... I don't know. The DM... Uh, in that area, if you roll investigation, you find that the wood is splintering. But there's not six orcs coming around the corner. You don't know that. You didn't roll perception. It really is like a bad video game. Like, what the hell? You are given a list of options, and you just have to hope that you stumble into the right one of them. Okay, so why did Wizards of the Coast make these changes? Why did they need to change? Well, there are two reasons, really. Number one is that 3.5 got complicated. In case you can't tell, it was an amendment to a prior edition, third edition. And in doing this strange half update, Wizards fixed a lot of things. But they also just kept adding and adding and adding. They didn't bloat content like they did with 5e, with adventures and supplements. They bloated the base game. There were two player's handbooks, two dungeon master's guides, and five monster manuals. I mean, come on, what, like, what even? It's still going. My face is blown out. I don't even know. Reason number two for why they had to update. Times were changing, man. It was 2007. We had entered the digital era, man. So they needed to make an addition that would be compatible with something else that they were developing alongside the game. A computer program to help you sort through this mess. The hope was, at the time, that 4E would be a system that you could make into a completely online experience. Like what Baldur's Gate 3 is now for D&D 5E, they wanted to do something like that with 4E. But they never did, so they made a simple addition for nothing. Rituals did not happen in 4th edition. Ritual spells, much like how they are in 5e, are spells that take time to cast and don't necessarily need to be known innately by your caster, but instead are stored into a ritual book, unless you're a wizard. Rituals took time, money, ingredients, and most importantly of all, you needed to have that spell written into a book or scroll already. Most of the time, you will not have one of those, and so you will be, as the kids say, shit out of luck. As for spells and regular magic, technically they're in the game, but they're just powers, like everything else. At will, per encounter, daily, yeah sure that's how spells work. And they were leveled with the fighter, the rogue, and the war what? warlord abilities, just like wizards wanted. There is no balance between hit points and damage, there is no dainty wizard with fireball versus a chad fighter with four attacks per turn. It's a guy, and he can do a thing that everyone else can do, but it's written slightly differently in a book. There are no spells in 4th edition, they are the same powers everyone else has, and there are no rituals in 4e, they are too hard to bother with. Yes, you could hybrid class, as per a later released supplement to the system, with only one other class, but it had to be done from the start. At level 2, you did it, and then you could never change your mind. It had to be done 50-50 exactly, so at level 4, if you were two rogue and one fighter, you had to take your next level in fighter. There was no other way. At 3.5 and now after with 5e, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I'm not going to justify anything more than that. You get it. Yes, kind of. 4th edition has a few things that it can definitely say were its own ideas, and I think that everyone else can see that they were genuinely good ideas. For example, 4th edition introduced the idea of minions, 
one hit point little goons that can charge in and your players can kill them in cool ways because a hit means a kill. So they can RP in combat with them because they know that when they hit they can say something cool and the DM can't be like, hold on, he didn't actually die. They had some neat ideas for powers that would later grow into their 5e abilities like battle master maneuvers, channel divinity options, or certain spells. Um, 4th edition made the warlock. That's pretty cool. But yeah, um, I think that's it. Those, those three things. Congrats, 4th edition. Okay, so that was 4th edition. It tried to be simpler than 3.5, and it completely failed. It wound up being so very, very complicated, and it died in six years. Rest in peace, 4th edition. Long live 5th edition. Thank you all for watching, everyone. This took a ton of work to make and research, and so I hope it was all worth it. Thank you to everyone who stuck around us in this past year, and to those new faces I see popping up all the time. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. Be sure to go and follow us on Patreon, as well as our Twitch page. We're gonna stream more, I promise. But yeah, I think that's, I think that's enough of me for today, so, uh, bye!